welcome to the Chinese American Museum. My name is David Yao. I'm senior advisor here. Um, thank you for coming this evening. Um, just a little bit of uh, background and propaganda. Uh, <laughs> uh, the Southern had a soft opening in 2019, uh, but obviously we shut down for 2020 during COVID. But we started doing a lot of uh, webinars and um, Zoom programs. And then when we opened up officially in 2021, we had a, lot, a number of um, uh, temporary uh, exhibits that last for anywhere between uh, six to eight months or longer. Uh, but uh, as we move forward uh, to tell the hardcore story of the Chinese American experience, uh, we will always have room to tell the uh, kind of to, to share with the American public um, the Chinese culture and our influence on the building of America. And then, um, and also, we want to outreach the other community groups, uh, immigrants, who are all from somewhere else, unless you are Native American. Uh, so that we can compare our immigrant experience, uh, then, then, and because we all contribute to building America. Yeah. And also, we want to uh, use the museum as a platform for uh, uh, discussions and uh, open dialogue, and also outreach to different groups who may not have um, known about what uh, the Chinese American uh, experience has been. So, but going forward, we only not only look back at history, but look forward to the next generation. That's why this evening we are so happy in having author uh, Anna Gehengwen here to talk about her book, um, or a series of books. Uh, she she wrote about the young uh, ABCs, Chinese uh, American born Chinese, and the experience and learning about the culture and well, perhaps the pressure they feel um, uh, of the traditional Chinese culture that uh, we were all subject to in one form or another. So, and we we're very fortunate to have uh, uh, Alan Fong, who is our program associate here, in, in conversation with Abigail. So with that, Alan, take it away. Um, just to give a little bit more background about Abigail and also how just like talented she is. Um, there are three books in the Love Boat series, Love Boat Taipei, Love Boat Reunion, and um, Love Boat Forever, which is the most recent one. Um, in addition to being a best-selling author, Abigail was also the producer for her film of Love Boat Taipei. And prior to becoming a full-time writer, she had a successful career in law and a leader in venture capital as well as artificial intelligence. So she's a very well-rounded person and has lots of experience in various industries. Um, so I guess I'll start with some questions about the book. Um, what initially inspired the Love Boat series and how much of your experience with Love Boat like, translated into Ever, Sophie, and Pearl's experience? Well, we want to say thank you for all of you for being here on a Monday night especially. I know like, some of the kids have school and so I'm just really appreciative that you all came out for this event. Um, I mentioned at the beginning, you know, are there any Love Boat alum in the audience? And so for those of you who aren't um, in the know, Love Boat is actually a real program that's been around since the 1960s. Um, and I'm curious actually how many people have heard of Love Boat program, even if you're not an alum. Prior to the books, of course. Okay. Yeah, so a minority in the room. And that was actually the case. That was, you know, for many years, um, this program was kind of a well-kept secret in the Asian American community. Um, and basically it was started by the Taiwanese government in the 1960s for Asian Americans and Asian Europeans and Australians to go back to Asia and learn language and culture of their family origin. Um, and parents would send their kids for that reason, but also to find a spouse. And so that's how it got the same thing, Love Boat. It was actually became after the American TV sitcom in the 1970s, which I realized we never explained in the movie or in the books. So I'm explaining it to you now, and I think I did get into the third book, I hope, I hope I did. I'm not sure if I did, actually. Um, but so it's a real program. And um, I, I got on the program myself. I was invited by the Taiwanese government um, because I was a presidential scholar in high school. And everyone who won these like, awards, like Cook Scholar, Google Scholar, which was Westinghouse at the time, um, and presidential scholar would get this trip for free. Everyone with a Chinese or Taiwanese last name. So I got this very nice letter, which I found recently from the government inviting me to learn language and culture on this program. And I showed up, and lo and behold, it ends up being this summer free-for-all where the kids who've been really good, studious kids their whole lives in, in the United States or you know, other countries are suddenly dropped off in this foreign country with no parental supervision. And they go crazy in the best of ways. So there's a lot of sneaking out clubbing, drinking snake butt sake, that was my husband, not me, um, and uh, exploring the nightlife 
um, we're doing a tour around the island, um, a lot of dating, so you know, definitely a lot of couples have come out of this program, which is why I asked about the kids. Um, but I'm really in the process learning to make their culture their own. And um, that's exactly kind of the story of Ever Wong in book one. She's an 18-year-old girl from Ohio who is running away from her heritage, gets sent on this program against her will, um, and, and then really learns um, what it means to be a girl between two cultures, and also what it means for her to pursue her passions as a dancer while still honoring her parents, which is so important to her as well. So that was the first book. Um, and I didn't ever expect it, the universe to expand into multiple books and now movies, so I, I do feel really fortunate to be here today. Yeah. Um, so I actually found, so in, not to spoil too much about the third book, but um, Pearl kind of gets in trouble on TikTok for having a character, an Asian caricature, and so many people online see this as being like racist, even though she is Chinese. Um, and I found the discussion in this book about being too Asian and being not Asian enough very interesting. Um, and it's one that I relate to a lot. So I was wondering how, if like, you experienced this growing up, this struggle, and like, does Pearl's experience navigating through this reflect like how you overcame this as well? Yeah, absolutely. So the second novel follows two of the fan favorites from the first book on like an adventure in back in Taiwan. Um, Sophie and Xavier take back control of their features. Um, the third novel is set six years later and it follows Ever's younger sister, Pearl. So, um, and exactly as you described it, the story begins where she's actually a classical musician. Um, she has just gotten accepted into a prestigious uh, music program in Manhattan and she's very excited to go. She takes like glamour shots with her mom um, and she takes all these photos to post on TikTok, and she does, like, I'm excited to come. And then, bam, she gets slammed. Um, she takes a photo of herself wearing a Chinese straw hat at the piano, which she, she happened to find sitting around the house. And it turns out Ever had brought it back from Mopo. And, and suddenly there's this big misunderstanding online where people are like, wow, this looks like a, a Chinese caricature. And, and she does not really think of herself as being Chinese, so she's just completely blindsided by this. Um, and she starts to respond, and she tries to justify it, and just you know, it gets out of control the way social media can get out of control. Um, and so the, the short of it is, the summer music program rescinds her offer. They say, you know what, this is bad, and we don't want to get involved in this. So she ends up going on Love Boat, which has been kind of chasing her for several years now since they loved her sister, and they've been inviting her. She said, nothing else to do this summer. It's her junior summer, which is really important. And so she ends up going on Love Boat to lay low for the summer. But in that process, she gets to unpack some of the things that are behind some of those misses on social media. And I do want to say, like, it's important that she also learns that the program that rescinded her offer actually did her a great injustice by not, not giving her time to rehabilitate her span. Actually, that was something that I, I saw happen a lot to women and minorities. They would withdraw um, quickly, or they would, they would actually allow themselves to be canceled. They would self-cancel. And um, so that was something I was exploring a little bit with her as well. Let's see. Um. So you said that like you weren't ex never expecting the universe to sort of expand um, into multiple books. Did you have trouble like coming up with inspiration for the next two books? Like what pushed you to like really develop those next two stories? My first novel, um, when I first wrote it, it was I, I did it at draft twenty six. I had to scrap the whole thing, <laughs> and that was because it was one hundred twenty thousand words. And it was from five points of view, Ever, Sophie, Rick, Xavier, and a couple of viewpoints um, from Jenna, who's Rick's girlfriend in the book, in the first book. And I couldn't figure out what was wrong with it. I just knew it was really shallow. And I finally figured out, oh, there's too much story for one novel. So at 26 drops, I scrapped it and I redid the whole thing just from Ever's point of view. Um, but it paid off because my other characters are really well rounded. It's the whole book from their point of view five times. Um, so I knew them really well and I was able to actually like kind of just leave all the ins and outs with her, her viewpoint. But because I had to condense it down just to her story, I had all this leftover story, especially Xavier's. Um, and Xavier is he's kind of the bad boy in the first book, um, but we find out later he's undiagnosed dyslexia and even more other, other learning differences. But he is the son of a wealthy Taiwanese empire, and he is in a very high-performing culture that that just wishes he would snap out of it. Whatever it is, it's wrong with his brain, like just snap out of it, stop being so, you know, all the words that were used because they didn't understand his brain was different. Um, and I really did want to explore the story. It was really important to me to, to for, for Xavier to get to have his 
to come to Presbyterian was to like he had a beautiful mind and um, that he had so much to bring to the table just by being himself. Yeah. And so that became book two. And when I when I signed the deal with Harper Collins, it was actually a two book deal. And shortly after we had the film deal, the film was like making progress and. Um, we were editing my second book, and at the very end of the second book, someone said something like, um, they, I think the kids were like, love book forever, love book forever. And my editor flagged it, and she's like, oh, this is the title of the next book. <laughs> <laughs> so I was not expecting to write a third one. Yeah. Um, and I pitched Harper, they asked me to pitch them a couple ideas, so I, I gave them two ideas. One was, um, and for those who've read the second book, this might be fun, um, it was going to feature Emma and Victor, who are two of the side characters in the second novel, on an adventure to look for, I think, Emma's mother. Um, and then the other idea was the story of Pearl going to love with six years later. So they picked that one. Yeah. Um, um, do you have a favorite character in the Love Boat series? It may be a bit like picking favorite children, but. Uh, no, it's exactly <laughs> like that. I think I can <laughs> pick one. Um, I, I think they're all like part of me in different ways, and they're also part of people I love and people I've met, and just kind of also like st stories that I've seen consistent threads through in the Asian American community. Um, like Ever is the girl running away from her heritage. Sophie Ha is actually, um, for those who read the first book, she seems like like a force of nature. She's brilliant, she's boy crazy, and you find out actually she believes that she's supposed to marry a guy, and, and that's how she's going to survive. And she's, she needs to marry a rich guy to take care of her family, and she gets course corrected through the love of experience. Um, but uh, yeah, I feel like I knew so many girls like that, like brilliant, and just they just somehow they were they were making themselves smaller than they needed to. Um, and then Xavier and Sophie both have learning differences. Actually, that never comes out about Sophie, but I, I think she actually is undiagnosed ADHD, um, which was also common for minority girls not to be diagnosed. So she and Xavier have that in common. But again, like the second book being about like neurodiversity and just getting to be themselves, um, I think that's like stuff I've drawn from my family, my experiences. Um, and then this this third one, uh, Pearl was harder to write because she's the younger sister. And I'm the oldest of three, so I thought, you know, gosh, Pearl just she had it so much easier than ever. <laughs> like paved the way, she had to like fight her parents, and she finally got the freedom to do what she loved. So Pearl got to do what she loved right from the beginning. Um, but I also felt like Pearl was really emotionally healthy and strong and a leader, a natural leader, and she and you, I, I loved getting to like be in love, be in like the love boat world with a different character as the lead and just how she is able to take ownership over so many things that happen. I really, Pearl was just such a joy to get to know. Um, I hadn't read many books that discuss the sort of internal like struggle between being Asian American. Um, and so I haven't read the other books, but I'm excited to pick them up now. Um, I would like to move into sort of questions about your process and like just writing in general. So how old were you when you started writing fiction? Like how did this, how did you get into wanting to be a novelist, I guess? I didn't know that I could be a writer for many, many years, but I, when I look back, I see it. Um, I started journaling when I was nine. It was like an assignment class, but I loved journaling. Um, and I journaled throughout my life. It was my way of, I think, just getting my emotions out. Like I, and I always would just jump in and just write how I felt. I never gave any context or anything, so it was just like pure writing, pure raw emotions, but I also coded it in case my mom looked at it. I understand what I was talking about. Um, but every opportunity I had in school that was like for like an open-ended assignment, I would take that and um, try to write a short story or a poem, and I used to tell stories to my brother and sister. Um, and actually, I just realized recently that these books are all kind of like the stories that I told my siblings. They're about kids in a world without adults. And that, that's really all of Love Boat. And also like my newest book, the fourth one that's coming, I'll tell you more about that in a bit. It's definitely a, a, a bunch of kids with no adults around and getting into trouble and getting out of trouble. Um, so, but I, because I never read anything of, by authors who were like me, and I never read anything about life like my own family, um, I just never thought I could be an author. I thought books were things you read about things you didn't know, um, which is true. Like I think we pick up books for that reason. But to be a writer, you actually need to write about the things you do know, or that you're going to research heavily. So my very first novel, which I still love, which my agent still wants me to bring out, um, it started off as like a high fantasy with a boy and a sword going to a, going through a portal into another world. And there is a cool like thing that I'm, I'm working on in it. But um, but the initial high concept was like it was derivative of 
of things that I've read before. Um, but that novel, it, I, the time I was going to write it, I was thinking about being a law professor, and I um, couldn't bring myself to write the article to do to go on the market. I'd done everything else. I'd clerked here on the DC circuit, and I'd practiced at Sullivan and Cromwell, and then I was, that was kind of the next step. Um, but it was so boring, and I, couldn't, I just couldn't do it. And my husband was like, well, why don't you just try this novel that you're excited about? And at the time, it felt like he was saying, like, why don't you just try to build a rocket ship, right? And I was like, that's how daunting it was. But I tried it, and it came pouring out of me, and that's when I realized, okay, wow, I guess there's something here. And it took me four more novels. Love Boat was my fifth novel before I um, was able to publish, but 10 years of writing. Wow. So you said you didn't, like, have anyone that was sort of like you and to look up to for in the writing world, but did you have any inspirations like for writing this particular book or even just that like you saw this author and was like, wow, I just love their stuff and I want to be able to write like them? Yeah, I would say it was Laura Ingalls and um, C.S. Lewis. So I loved the Laura Ingalls Wild books. I read them over and over. And the same with Narnia. Um, my, my honeymoon, I actually brought book one, book seven, to my husband. Like I, I was like, I should have just looked back then. That was like the writing on the wall. Um, but yeah, I, I read some Asian American authors growing up, but I didn't relate to anything that was in their books. I'm not sure why. Um, but those those other authors, I really I really enjoyed. I think with Laura Ingalls, what was painful for me was to know that her mother was racist. And so I, I wanted, like, I think this is true for people who love books, you want to live in that world. You want to just like sink into those pages and like be in that world and meet the characters. But I knew that deep down if I met Laura, if I met her mom, her mom wouldn't like me. And Laura herself, who was like super open-minded and who like was really curious about Indians, she'd be curious about me in a way that I wasn't equipped to deal with as a child. And so I think there was a, there was a bit of loneliness too in loving these books so much, but also feeling like, oh, they, they will not accept me. Yeah. Um. What was the transition like going from full-time lawyer to full-time author? Like, was you mentioned it was scary kind of to like make that leap. Um, could you like, did you? I know you talked about it with your husband, but like, did you talk to your family about it? How did your parents react considering all of the discussion about pressure to be, I don't know, a successful quote unquote uh, like lawyer, doctor, etc. type thing. So my um, my journey wasn't medicine and dancing the way it is forever. Like my parents actually wanted me to go into government and politics. I studied international relations and government at Harvard, um, and I, know, I think that's actually unusual for Asian American parents of their generation. But they really wanted me to go to give a voice to the community and to kind of advocate for people. I saw my parents advocating. They would they would go to the school to talk to principals, not about us, but about you know the other immigrant kid who had some misunderstanding with the administration. They would try to go and, and smooth things over, help explain. Um, so I kind of grew up with that model, but I, I'd come here to DC um, to work on Capitol Hill, as I mentioned. And there was that moment when I was like, I called my dad, and I, I can't do this. And I was crying, I'm like, cannot, this is not for me. Like, it's all these young people with too much power and no life experience, and it just, it just did not sit well with me. Um, and he said, no, it's okay. And that was actually really important for me to hear that from him. It's okay, because I, I remember feeling like I'm letting everybody down. Like everybody was like, "Oh, you went to Harvard, and you're gonna like save the world." I'm like, "No, I'm not. I'm not, not going to do any of those things." Um, but um, I think going into law um, was a little bit kind of still on that same path of like advocacy, um, and I I did actually stay in law practice for a while. So that decision not to become a law professor was pivotal. Um, after that, I ended up taking maternity leave for three years, and that's when I started writing seriously. So I wrote that first novel, I wrote a second novel, but I, I wasn't, I was getting bites from agents, but no book deals, and I was thinking, you know, I really need to finish my law training because I need to support my family. I have two young children at the time, and if something happened to my husband, then I would have nothing, no degree, you know, or no experiences, or no skills to support my kids. So I did go back to law. Right as I went back to the law firm, um, I sent out my second novel to the agents in the world and I was waiting for them to get back to me while I was practicing law. Um, and then I made my second big decision, which was to leave the law firm and go in-house. And I don't know if there are any lawyers in the room. Oh, only one. That's, that's actually unusual for DC. Um, <laughs> but uh, and it was actually a scary choice to, to step off that treadmill um, and go in-house. But going in-house, 
Um, I loved it, actually. I was able to be closer to the business side of things. I moved into a venture capital lawyer role, which was actually rare to get. I was in the life, I was working with the lifeblood of Silicon Valley. Um, by then I moved out there with my husband. Um, and I had time to write and raise my kids. And so, so that ended up being like my, my role for 10 years. And I said, if I had gotten a book deal sooner, then I probably wouldn't have had all these professional experiences, but I didn't get a book deal. I was just writing on the side. I, I got my MFA program. I did an MFA on the way. Um, I kind of um, using my vacation time to go on campus and writing like 24 hours with a, 25 hours a week with a professor remotely. Um, and this whole time I just kept working in venture capital and getting to know the AI of space and technology companies. And so all that ended up becoming fodder for my stories. Um, and I, I didn't actually leave my job um, until about two years ago. So now I'm, I am doing the creative work full time. But it took me a long time to even to be in a position where I felt I could leave. And I didn't leave even after we hit the New York Times list with the first book, and even after I had a movie like substantially in the way, I, I was not brave enough to leave, actually. And I, when I did, finally, I was like, I should have done this sooner. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, now I'm enjoying what I'm doing. Speaking of the movie, how is it like becoming a film producer? Um, can you speak more about what sort of role that entails for making a movie? Well, it was important for, for me and my reps that I be involved in, in the adaptation because it's an all Asian American cast. There's 30 different Asian American characters. It's a very uniquely Asian American story. And being able to, like, I, I wrote it because I wasn't seeing um, a diversity of representation of Asian Americans in Hollywood. There's, there's a lot of tropes at the time. And when the producers asked me, what's the most important thing to you, um, I said, it's, 30 different Asian American characters. I want to see that diversity reflected on the screen because we are a diverse community. We know that we're a diverse community, but for some reason we're just not seeing it in the media. So I'm happy we got there with that. Um, but that is partly why I became an executive producer on the film. Um, but I also wanted to learn the ropes. Like I did, I know it's really hard to get film experience, and so I, it was an opportunity. Love Boat was an opportunity for me to get that, and I was involved from from the beginning to the end. Um, so that was. You know, finding a screenwriter and then going back and forth with the screenwriter and talking about the, the shaping of the script, finding a director who I'd actually met prior to signing on with my producers, um, and then casting, which is really fun. And then we filmed in Taipei for uh, two months at the height of COVID. Um, <laughs> and uh, we all had to go through two weeks of quarantine in the hotels there. But then once we were inside um, and out of quarantine, we were just living in a free society at the time when everyone was still on lockdown in California, especially. So that was wonderful. That was like a magic time. We were free, we were on set together. We were also isolated, so it was like a closed set and we really bonded very tightly. Almost like another love boat. Exactly. <laughs> exactly what we described it as. So, um, for a lot of the cast, like coming from North America, sure, yeah. it was the first time going back to Asia, and so we had wow. we had such a good time. Yeah. Will there be a film two and three, perhaps? I hope so. I would love to make more films. Um, there's so many. It's so hard to make a movie. Um, it's impossible to be made it so fast. Um, but the movie did well on Paramount+. Plus. Um, I was actually, my agents and I, were, we were all worried it was going to tank because it came out during the double strike in Hollywood. I don't know if oh, folks are yeah. familiar with it. Yeah. But the actors were on strike, the screenwriters were on strike, nobody was allowed to promote. And for a film like this, I felt like really important that the talent be able to promote it. And but the Asian American community really, really came out for the film. They held screenings for me around the country. I did a, I did, I did a talk with um, folks in New York, and it ended up having 120,000 views on Facebook. And then some of my Instagram posts hit. I have one that's at 9.6 million views now of um, behind the scenes photos from the movie. And so, like the community really came out for the film, and it ended up hitting the top comedies chart on Paramount Plus. And Paramount Plus actually reported. In Q3, they added 2.7 million subscribers to their date, which is huge. It was a 48% jump from where they had been the prior year. And they haven't told me that that's because of my movie. <laughs> um, but my movie came out in August, and Q3 is from July to September. So, and the whole point of them acquiring um, Love and Taipei was because they wanted to add new subscribers to reach a new demographic. So I am, I think they're happy. Um, a lot goes into making a movie, but yeah. You know, spread the word for the films, spread the word for the books, and tell Paramount Plus that you want another movie. Yeah. Um, so before we go into audience questions about the book, perhaps we'd like to talk more about your new book that's yes, coming out. Yes, thank you. All right, so this is called Kisses, Codes, and Conspiracies. Um, I personally, 
that's not the title I would have picked, but I think it gets the job done. <laughs> it's okay. Um, it's, a, it's a new standalone. It's outside the Lobo universe. And um, it, it is based on a short story that I wrote for Macmillan and the idiom, it's called The Idiom Algorithm um, in the serendipity, serendipity Anthology. So it was about 10 romantic tropes um, turned on their heads. And my editor there loved the short story so much, she asked me for a um, novel that followed the characters into a new world, so, or into a new adventure. Um, and she also was interested in having a babysitting story. So this is the most unusual babysitting story you've ever heard. I, I'm glad she let me keep the story because it really was, I don't think it was what she envisioned, but she really loved it and I loved working with her on it. Um, but Tan Lee is a 17-year-old boy in Silicon Valley. Um, he, his parents go off to Hawaii with Winter's mom. Winter Wu is actually a tenant in his house. Um, and he and Winter went to prom together. Um, they shared this magical kiss, but then they realized, well, we cannot do this. You're my landlord, I'm your tenant. Like, no, this is, like, he's not gonna be that guy. They don't want the situation. She cannot jeopardize her mom's living situation. So then the parents, like, thwart that by going off together to Hawaii and leave the two of them to babysit his younger sister, Sana. Um, and lo and behold, his ex-girlfriend from Shanghai shows up on his doorstep with millions of dollars in cryptocurrencies stolen from her billionaire father and thugs on her heels. And so these thugs go chasing them all around the Bay Area. Um, it ends up being this like, caper, this heist. I had so much fun writing it. It's kind of like a thriller in a rom-com, so it's a little different than like, the Love Boat world. Um, but it's like, you know, the same kind of, like you get to explore Silicon Valley um, in a very tight time frame, much much shorter than Mobo, um, and it comes out August 2024. Well, we're excited and ready to read it. Um, so now, would anybody from the audience like to ask Abby any questions or any like favorite parts that they would like to share? And so, let me think about your questions. Um, I got folks to sign up for my newsletter, and I'm going to do a drawing right after the Q and A. So if you haven't given me your name and email, like we can pass this out to you guys. I think I saw some new folks come in. Hand it over. Thank you. All right. So who's going to be brave and ask the question first? Sure, why not? <laughs> well, first of all, I've been enjoying uh, the whole Love Boat universe. Um, I'm excited to, to read the third book. Okay. Read the first book, the second book, as well as watch the movie. Um, question to you, um, both as a producer and also a writer. Um, there were obviously some changes made between the movie and the book. Uh, the title was changed, and of course the ending was very different. Um, so I was hoping you could talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for the question. Um, so the title change. Uh, the movie is called Love in Taipei instead of Love of Taipei, and that was a decision by Paramount Plus, which I actually um, I think it makes sense. Like I think the bookseller, the publisher, the author, you always want the, book, the movie and the book to be the same name so that you can discover one and the other. Um, but the reason they changed it is, is Paramount Plus is international, and Love in Taipei they felt would translate more to international audiences, and I actually think that's true because Love Boat is an American. TV series, and that, that's where the nickname came from. So I don't think people in other countries would know about Love Boat anyways, even if they didn't know about the Love Boat Taiwan program. Um, but um, some of my foreign language titles are also Love in Taipei, actually. I think my Brazil one and my Hungarian one, specifically, I think there may even be others. Um, so I understood that change. Um, but then we had to do extra work. Um, my, my publicist, Taylan, is here from Harper. Um, because we had to do extra work to make sure people can, when they hear about the movie, they know there's a book. Um, and you know, and vice versa. So it, it just is a little bit more of a lift. Um, and then the ending, yes, the ending. Um, I think of the movie, okay, so as the author of a book, you have almost complete control over the story. It's just you and the page for many years or how long, however long it takes you. And that's you and your editor and you and your agent, but they, they actually defer to you as the author. Um, every single, like even the copy edits, they always run by me, even if I don't want them to run it by me. I'm like, just do whatever you want to make it better. Um, but like all that is like ultimately the author's control. But when you make a film, you're ceding control, like yes to your producers, but you're also ceding control to 300 people. And I think in some ways, having gone through the whole process, that more than anything is what shaped like how the movie turned out. Um, everybody actually wants to leave their stamp on the movie in their own way. And so like you can see people like fighting to get their line in, and once they got that line in, that kind of shifts the direction of things. And, um, and of course, you've got the actors who they bring their own sensibility to every take, and the director brings his own sensibilities, and, and like things are changed in the script, and so those kind of took different directions. Um, and so in the end, like it's the producers who make the call about you know what direction to take, um, but they also have to work with the material that they have. So I think 
creatively of this story. Um, I think of the movie as and the romance arc ends at the midpoint because she does, you know, it happens at the midpoint. Um, even though her journey with her family is completed in the movie and, and in the book as well. So I'm hopeful that we could do more, but for now I think what I'm saying, you know, you watch the movie and then you can continue the journey in not only the second half of the second book, but the second and third books as well. Thank you. Other questions? Yep. Um, you, maybe I missed what you had said, but earlier you mentioned about how some Asian, some Asian American stories that you've read, you didn't feel to do too much connection to them. What opportunities are there for Asian American stories kind of looking for? They say, oh, there's some, there's an, there's an area here that can be explored for the for the American market or the, for the world to hear. Yeah, well, I think this is a great time to be writing diverse stories. Like, I think that things have really changed a lot. Um, when I started writing, I didn't know I could write an Asian American main character, and that was actually true. Um, 15 years before my time, there was an Asian American writer, and um, she got a book deal but she's told by the publisher that she could only publish it if she would change her Chinese boy to a white boy um, wow. for marketing reasons. And this story was in our community, we knew this. And so I just never wrote an Asian American main character. I, I just knew that I could not publish. Um, so it wasn't until my, four, my fifth novel that I actually, I had my first main character who was Asian American. My, my other four novels, my Asian American characters were like strong secondary characters, but never the main. Um, and you know, I was fortunately encouraged by people in my MFA program to, to write what I know, and, and they, they understood that the market had shifted, um, and it has. Um, now, like, after Love of Tokyo, I've seen so many more Asian American novels come out, and there's, like, stories about girls going back to Japan and finding their heritage, right? It's, like, it's like interesting, but there's also just so many more stories that can be told. I think there's, like, horror stories and fantasy, Asian fantasies, and um, really every genre is bubbling up, so I think that's... My, my biggest advice to people who are writing or aspiring storytellers is to write really what only you can write and what only you know, because there are like so many stories in our community that still haven't been told yet. Well, um, two questions. What advice do you have for um, somebody who might be interested in writing? Um, and then also, how is it being an author in this current stage of the world where you know there's so much more digital media and other things competing for people's attention and you see like, publishing houses sort of um, some of them folding, some of them, you know, combining into others. And just wondering if you have you know perspective on that. Yeah, so uh, advice for aspiring writers, um, in addition to writing what you know, um, read widely. Read widely in lots of genres, um, read widely in the genre that you love, um, and then write. Yeah, people told me that it would take 10,000 hours, a million, a million words. I was hoping to be a prodigy and be faster than that, but it took me exactly that, 10 years, and it must have been more than a million words. Um, and lots of rejection. Like, I think an actor's life is mostly rejection because you have to audition for so many roles, and it's true for writers, too. Just a lot of rejection, partly because like you're still learning to write, but also because it, it really is a subjective industry of people um, they want to work on things that they, they resonate with and you know you and your friends don't love the same movies and the same books either and that's perfectly fine it doesn't mean the movie's bad it just means that it's not for you and that's true for agents and editors too and so um, it just takes a while to find those, those things that resonate with you and I think sometimes being from like a minority culture it felt like it was harder to find those people who resonated with us but it does feel like things have changed and shifted and now there are more. Um, and your second question remind me um, about the landscape yeah. of publishing these days, what right. it's like to be an author. Yeah, oh gosh, Taylor, you're probably better at answering this than me. Um, there is a lot of, um, especially during COVID, like digital promotions became, uh, have become really important. Um, definitely like TikTok actually does sell books. I'm terrible at TikTok, unfortunately. <laughs> um, people, yeah, people discover content that way. Um, there's still as many books being published. And there's a lot of books being published. I mean, do you know, is it more than before? It feels like there's more than before now. Yeah, I think it's as much as ever. As it's much as ever, at least. Yeah, there's a lot of books being published. And I will I will quote someone unattributed. She said, you never quote her in person. But she thinks there's too many books being published, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and it's possible there's too many books being published that are the same thing. Because there is a bit of, like, People, I think there's a conservatism in publishing where you know that something sold before, so if you publish something else like it, then it'll probably sell again. 
And sometimes that's true. Like sometimes people want something that's familiar, but a little, like just a little bit less familiar. Like they want to know the Cinderella story. I mean, actually, my books in some ways are Cinderella stories. This, the third one, there's a glass slipper story in it where she has to find this mysterious suitor that she met in the dark based on a sneaker. So that's the glass slipper. <laughs> um, but yeah, people. And so I think there's a bit of that conservatism where people want like more of what they know. Um, but it does feel like a lot of books are being published now, despite like you know all this other competition. But it's true, there's also more competition for eyeballs. Um, but I will add, I heard just at this Yale Fest festival I was at, one of the authors said that reading a book is the only medium that actually rewires your brain in a healthy way. Wow. So I was like, oh, I need to go research this. That sounds yes. great. Um, and I'm going to make my kids read more. <laughs> um, as a writer, you have to do a lot of research. And I think this is a two-part question. What was the thing that you liked most researching for the local series? And what's the most interesting thing that you researched? So I actually went to Tai. So the question is about what was the most interesting thing that I researched for the books. Um, so I actually went to Taipei. I've been there now five times. The first time was with my family when I was 12. The second was to go on the low book program, the real one. And the third was to research the first book. So I went by myself in October. Um, I did like three days in the city where I just ran around like to all the sites. I checked out the blue pipe that my husband told me about. So there's a blue pipe that extends from campus over the Keelung River. And my husband and his friends seeped out of this blue pipe. And I never, I didn't know this existed because I just sn snuck out the front door with my friends and other people like jumped over this wall. Um, so I went and looked, there really is this blue pipe that goes like all the way across the river. And so that became the escape mechanism in the first book because like how could you not do it? We couldn't put it in the movie because it was too dangerous. But, uh, but it is in the book. Um, so that was fun to see that. Um, and then I did a tour around the island, um, which I loved as, as a, a student on the Love Book program. And I wanted to fit it into the novel. It ended up being a really condensed thing in the novel. Um, but on that tour, I would see um, food that reminded me of my mom and dad, like a platter of fried eggs, um, or like certain fruits that my mom adored. And I realized in those moments that Ever would also think of her parents, like, and associate like those salted eggs, like my dad made those. Um, and since she was actually running away from her parents and she was angry with them for sending her to Taipei, it was actually a really good moment for her to be forced to think about her parents when she doesn't actually want to think about them. But it, but in a way that you know kind of forced her to think about like her relationship with them when she wanted. So I, I think those moments where I, I felt like this emotional connection to my character were I think those were like the gems of, of my research. Um, have you experienced writer's block? And if you have, how have you worked through it? And then the second question is, um, you've had some shifts in your career. What was that like for your kids observing this and do they think of you as an author? So have I ever had writer's block? I don't actually think I do have it. So I'm, I know that's like disappointing as an answer. Um, but what, what I do do is I have multiple projects. And I think that might be why I don't have writer's block, because if I get stuck on something, I just shift to one of the other projects. And then the way I, I've also learned over time the way my brain works. And so I have a lot of ideas all the time. Um, I have my, the most ideas in the morning when I wake up. Sometimes like, I think my subconscious works on it at night, but it's, it's true with a lot of people. So I wake up with lots of ideas. I have to write them down before I lose them, because I will lose them if I don't. Um, and then when I have a moment to sit down, which I now have more structured time to do, um, I organize those thoughts and ideas. I also carry um, on my phone, I have a million files with different projects. And so when I get an idea, I, I usually know which project it belongs to, and so I just slot it in there. And that's kind of my way of keeping myself organized. Um, and then I, now that I'm we're also doing producing projects, what I do is I structure my day so I do my writing in the morning, and then I take my meetings and produce in the afternoon um, when I have less energy. And so I save my, my main brain power for the hard part, which is the writing. Uh, and then there's that question about what do my kids think of it? I think they seem like a lot of like hard work and a lot of resilience and a lot of rejection. And they've seen me like have some low moments, um, like when Lobo, when I had scrap version 26, that was a that was a real low moment for me. Um, it had been rejected actually. And I didn't know it was wrong, and I also had gone out for two promotions at work, and I came in number two for both of them. And so then, when I think I felt like I did everything wrong, I'd spread myself too thin. Plus, I think when you're a mom, you always feel that way. Like you can't, you're not a good mom, you're not a good worker, and I wasn't a good writer. Um, but then everything kind of changed after that, and they got to see the benefit of that. Um, people always want to know why it changed. So um, I ended up getting a double promotion at work into an AI business role instead of these legal jobs that I was going for. So it was a much better role than the ones I'd applied for. And the reason I believe I got those jobs is because I put myself out there. So I got on the radar screen of 
senior people in my company, and I had a chance to like do a practice interview with one of them and told her I wanted to speak in public, and she gave me my first speaking opportunity at a general counsel's um, conference, and then from there I went on to speak on AI around the world, and the last gig was I hosted Intel's AI podcast, and I got to host all the industry leaders in the space, which is really cool. Um, and then the book, I think just having my critique partners come around me and encourage me to keep going, pick me up you know, off the floor. Um, they told me, you know, your stuff is good. There's reasons you're not getting through the gate. And um, they gave me great advice, and I kept going. This will probably be our last question, okay. so just letting you know. So we have time to sign books downstairs. OK, and I have to do the raffle. Yes, yes. Um, as you said, Asian American movies have been having a moment, and some momentum finally, of some uh, pretty popular ones recently, like Xiang Chi or Everything Everywhere All at Once, um, Crazy Rich Asians. Do you have a favorite? Well, I, I love all of them. I think they're all so different. Um, the funny thing about being in Asian American Hollywood, I've met most of Asian American Hollywood now, uh, is they kept referring me to them, like, oh, you need to meet this producer, that producer, or this director, and that director. And we're all really different from each other, like creatively. Like we're all Asian American, but we have very different sensibilities, different aesthetics. So like if we were not Asian American, we might not actually resonate with each other's work. Um, and so that's part of why it's important to have like a plurality of voices and plur plurality of like just creatives out there. Um, but I do love all of them because I think they all help to build our body of work as a community and just showcase again that diversity that I know we have. So I. Um, I thought, okay, so Paramount Plus has been awesome. As I said, they gave me $25 gift cards for people who did not have um, Paramount Plus yet. So what I'll do is I'll raffle these off first. If you have Paramount Plus, um, or you want the other one, then you tell me, and I've got two of them. So these are fans from the LA premiere. They're limited edition, there's not very many of them. Um, but Paramount Plus, again, they just gave me the extras afterwards, and so I'm, I'm raffling them off at my book events. Okay, so maybe you want to pick or not? Sure. Shuffle them a little bit. Um, the first one is Carson Turbush. Martha Byers. Just 
hate but do So yeah, we will be doing book signs downstairs. So if you would like to mosey your way down, um, we'll get started down there.